Welcome to the What If Podcast. We're sharing an ever-growing collection of stories from the Belmont entrepreneur community to inspire you to start and keep going. I'm your host, Elizabeth Bortmaker. Here we go. Hi, Jeff. Great to see you. you. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you for being on the podcast. This is actually our last episode of the season, and I really thought you would be the perfect final guest of the season and for us to tell your story because you really are the founder of all of this here at Belmont. None of this would exist without you. So for those who are listening who don't know, Dr. Jeff Cornwall came to Belmont in 2003 and developed the entrepreneurship curriculum, the major and the minor, and at the same time, founded our Entrepreneurship Center to be an experiential learning piece outside of the classroom for students to learn entrepreneurship. Now it's been almost 20 years since you started this, and in May, Dr. Cornwall just retired and is going to be moving on to the next chapter of his life, but your legacy will will obviously live on, and we're just so grateful for everything you've built, but Let's kind of go back to the beginning. Will you tell all the listeners, tell us who you were, what you were doing before 2003, and then what that story was of coming to Belmont and starting the program? You know, back then, many schools didn't have an entrepreneurship program. It was still a very new discipline. So walk us through that whole journey of developing the curriculum and the center and and all that. So big question to start out with. Oh, that's all good. So... um... I really trace a lot of this journey <laughs> uh, back to 1972, um, but I promise I'll keep this short. Um, in, in 1972, um, my dad, who was, um, we would call him an angel investor today. Um, that, that term wasn't used in the 70s, but he was. And, and, and his latest thing that he invested in was uh, a marina on the lake where uh, we, we lived in, in Wisconsin. And, and for some reason, he decided that, that he would put his teenage son in charge of the retail part of this business. So my first experience in business was running a retail operation for this marina. That wasn't real complicated. It was, it was a, a bait shop and we sold gasoline and we rented little fishing boats, but I had to do the, I had to do all the payroll and I, or not the payroll, but I had to do the hiring, the firing. I had to do the scheduling and, and it was great experience. And, and that was when I really caught the bug of, of entrepreneurship and small business. Um, so I was in, involved in lots of other things, some of them family businesses, some of them my own, most of them fairly small in the seventies and, and even into the early eighties. And then uh, I decided to go to grad school and thought an MBA would be good. So I went and got an MBA in finance, um, thought it would be helpful because I was going to go back and, and probably get more involved in some family business stuff uh, and probably some of my own. Uh, it was my thinking. But unfortunately, I came out of my MBA in 1980, which was um, an economy that uh, was uh, – considered probably one of the worst we've been through since the Great Depression. Um, And and people are even saying that what we're going through today may not be as bad as what happened in the 70s. That's how bad it was. So I couldn't get a job. I had an MBA in finance from a really good program, uh, top of my class, um, couldn't even get an interview. And uh, um, really wasn't, I decided I didn't want to go back and work in family business. I, I'd learned that my dad and I, as close as we were, uh, had no business working together. We were too much alike. And, and we both wanted to be in charge. So um, long story short, the only job I was able to get uh, an offer for was a teaching job in Missouri. Kentucky, uh, where I was doing my MBA, found out that I was looking at that. And they said, well, why don't you stay here, get your doctorate. Your wife has a good job in town. You like it here. And then, you know, kind of stay in school and weather the storm and you can go out and start your career. So I started a doctoral program. I had no intention of being a professor. Wasn't even sure what that all meant. 
it was a crash course. I learned very quickly what it meant. And I really enjoyed it. Um, first job I got in teaching um, was in the early 80s. And, and in, in those days, there was entrepreneurship probably at maybe a half a dozen schools in the country. And, and usually it was called small business. A couple of them called it entrepreneurship. It was it, that that's where the state of things were. Um, but that was my home. I, I didn't like the corporate stuff. I never worked in a corporation, but business schools were all about training tomorrow's corporate leaders. So um, I ended up getting in, in a lot of trouble uh, in my first job teaching um, with the other faculty because they hated the fact that I was trying to start all these entrepreneurship courses. Um, they yell at me in the hallways. Uh, I had parents calling me, uh, berating me for trying to corrupt their child's mind uh, you know, because they need to get a good job and work for 30 years and get a gold watch. So um, when... When the first opportunity came along to leave higher education, I was I was ready to do the first opportunity that I thought was exciting to me. I, I took it. Um, so I left. I had just gotten tenure, uh, but I quit and and went and started a healthcare company with two other guys in North Carolina who I'd been consulting with. Uh, we did that for ten years. We actually started a dozen or so uh, companies. Uh, in the mental health area during the early days of managed care. It was high growth, it was high stress. And, and at the end of it all, we had, we had a pretty decent exit and, and my health was a mess. And, and so my wife, um, uh, in her infinite wisdom, put me in timeout and wouldn't let me start another business. And, and uh, uh, during those six months, I'd had a lot of time for discernment and, and, and and, and really a lot of introspection about what I wanted to do. And, and eventually with a little prodding from her, I decided to consider possibly going back into teaching. And as I started to look into that, um, I discovered that all of a sudden entrepreneurship had become hot. It had gone from the pariah in, in the early eighties um, to the, the hottest thing in the world in the early nineties. And, and there were all these really cool positions open and, uh, lots of endowed chairs starting to pop up. There was still only maybe a hundred schools or so at that time. Um, and one of them happened to be a school that my, Anne had asked me, uh, my wife had asked me if there was one school I'd love to go to, what was it? And I said St. Thomas up in the Twin Cities because they were one of the very first. It was a really cool program the way they did it. Um, I liked the fact it was a private university and, and faith-based university. So. Um, Two weeks later, the ad popped up for that endowed chair. The guy who had founded that program left. And so I went up and interviewed. I interviewed for a few other programs. Nothing really excited me a whole lot, but that one did. Um, turns out, uh, I, I found out later I was an afterthought by the search committee. Um, they were really looking for more of a pure academic, which I wasn't. Uh, I mean, I had done some publication early in my life, but I was not an academic. Uh, in the purest sense. Um, but the dean got really excited about me. And so um, he got approval to hire two people. So they hired two endowed chairs. One was a pure academic and, and, uh, and I was the more practitioner oriented kind of person. So she and I worked together pretty well. We, we spoke different languages, obviously, and had different kind of views of the world. But um, we were able to, to take a program that had, had been a top rank program, but had fallen out of the rankings. And by the time I left, and I was there for uh, six years. Uh, we, and I say we, because it was, a, it was a pretty big group of us, but uh, I was a department chair. She ran the graduate program. Uh, we got back and we were ranked third in the Entrepreneur Magazine rankings my last year there. Um, we decided we wanted to get back to the Southeast. We love living in the Southeast. And, and, and so, um, or, or at least somewhere warm. So started looking for another position. Our kids were going into college. So it was a, a time when we could do that. It was 20 years ago. Um, and this position popped up at this school called Belmont, which I had never heard of. I had no idea what Belmont was. Uh, read about it. And I thought, well, okay, it's a Baptist school. Um, I'm Catholic. I'm not sure how well that's going to work out. Um, and, 
Um, long story short, um, we we ended up having a uh, real strong mutual interest, uh, both from Belmont and from me, in, in making this thing work. And we eventually found a way to make it work, uh, which was difficult because they hadn't hired somebody like me before. They hadn't gone out and done a national search for this kind of position. It was it had been the sleepy little Baptist college. Now, since then, Belmont, you know, obviously today makes the big, huge, bold steps, but this is a big deal for them. I, I, they interviewed me for three days um, because, you know, they knew they had to give me tenure, which I had never given somebody tenure coming in. They And and they were really nervous about this. They'd never had much success with what, what they called a center director. Uh, and, and they weren't quite sure what that was and what it was supposed to do, but they knew they needed to have one. So uh, I, I was able to kind of cast a vision and build some trust. And, and, and I got extremely excited about the, the culture at Belmont and, and, and even more so Nashville as a city to do this. Because Nashville was just starting to emerge at that point in time, 20 years ago. So, um, so it ended up moving uh, our family to this college that no one, no one in the, in the, in the, in the Academy of Entrepreneurship had heard of Belmont because they had never had a program before. Uh, and a lot of people thought I was nuts, but uh, my gut instinct was that it was the right move and uh, I, I, it seemed to work out pretty well for us. So that's how I, I got I think there. so. Yeah. How did Anne feel about the big move at that time? You know, she knew what she was getting into when, when we got married. Yeah. Um, and and she always liked to talk about all of our adventures. Um, we moved around the country quite a bit. And I was, I tried different things. I did different things. She knew I was an entrepreneur. Um, and, and so she, she was kind of, she was ready for another adventure. And she was in a good spot. We had, we we waited till our youngest was graduating from high school. We didn't want to move her until she was out. But Maggie was about to graduate from high school, so it was a good time. So uh, she's uh, she's been pretty um, uh, willing to 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 uh, chase some of my my dreams with me, and I and I do yeah. mean with me. She's been a good partner through all of that. So and Maggie came to Belmont as well. Yeah, my son did first. Our son mm-hmm. transferred when I came in, and then um, a year later, Maggie transferred in. So, and then both of our kids ended up here. Yeah. So, you've also written textbooks. Yes. Yes. So, you came to Belmont. Um, you were creating this whole new program at Belmont that had not existed. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the genesis of the the center and why you felt like that was important, but also your academic journey. And when did you start to write textbooks and get more involved in the curriculum side of things? I got intrigued by the curriculum side of things. Um, Back when I was that renegade faculty member in the early eighties, getting yelled at. And uh, um, I found, I, I really enjoyed the curriculum design process. And I learned a lot about it and I, and I, it was intriguing to me. And it reminded me a, a lot of, of the way I did my business modeling for my businesses. So the, actually the very first textbook I wrote, I wrote in that early career uh, when, I, when I had just gotten out of my doctorate program. It was a textbook on, on organizational entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, sometimes it's called intrapreneurship today. That was the first thing I did with, with writing a book. Uh, and that's where I, I got my early interest in curriculum design. So at St. Thomas, where I was before Belmont, their program had not been uh, updated in years. The, the guy who founded the program did it his way. He saw no need to tweak it. It was working just fine. And so he never did much. And, by the time I got there, um, I could tell that we were uh, significantly out of date and there were some big gaps in terms of information. It was, um, I'm a big advocate of financial literacy for entrepreneurs and, and it was very light on the financial side. Uh, and, and so I really tried to beef that up, which led to my second textbook. Uh, which was a book on entrepreneurial finance because 
it, it talked about the whole journey of entrepreneurship and, and everything from bootstrapping to uh, to family and friends money to angel investment to bank financing everything. And so it's very people. entrepreneurial of you. You're like, this isn't out there. It needs to be. So I'm just going to do it. It's kind of that's kind of how I do everything. And yeah. so um, so that that then got attention there at St. Thomas. And so I had a couple other people come to me about books. The 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 next book I got into was um, was a book that came out of a course I taught with a theologian at St. Thomas. It took a year to develop the course before we taught it. And and the course uh, was a great success. We actually got USASB, which is our national academic organization, United States Association of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. We got their model course award for that course the second year we taught it, awesome. which was pretty cool given that it was basically a theology course. Yeah. Uh, but we got the, the entrepreneurship course award for that. And then when I when I came to Belmont, I, I developed three more books. Uh, two of them were intro books that uh, Pearson uh, approached me, the big publish, book publisher, about. Um, they had two titles, which these are the first two books I ever was involved in that we actually made money on, to speak up. Most, most books you don't make much money on. All, all of my books weave together with my interest in curriculum. And... and uh, sometimes it's been because the book didn't exist. Sometimes I want to make something better. Sometimes it, it, it was kind of a tangent, but they all kind of fit together that way. Uh, and so I, I love that process. I love the process of, of, of building curriculum. I love the process of writing textbooks. As, this, as, as a lot of people have said, you know, that's, I think, how I get my, my entrepreneurial itch taken care of. So that's, that's been my journey. It's been fun. Um, and, and uh, it, it's probably the part of academics that I enjoy the most is that kind of creative process. I mean, I love being in the classroom, but what I really love the most is that design kind of work. So what do you say to people? You know, one of the common pushback comments that I get sometimes when I tell people what I do for a living, a lot of people say, oh, you can't teach entrepreneurship. You're either born with it or you're not. Uh, obviously, you and I really disagree with that sentiment, but you being someone who's designed multiple textbooks, multiple curriculum ideas around entrepreneurial uh, education, how do you respond to that comment that you can't actually teach entrepreneurship? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of not on either camp. I'm sort of in a different view on this one. Um, I don't think everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. I think it takes a certain personality. It takes a certain um, work ethic. It takes uh, certain tolerances in terms of risk and uncertainty and stress and all that kind of stuff. So it's not for everybody. And so I, I kind of agree a little bit. And I would say I can't teach somebody to want to be an entrepreneur. Um, but somebody who has the right temperament, the right personality, the right approach to life, which, you know, that that, that is a huge palette of different personalities. And, and, and you've seen that. We have so many different kinds of people, different ages, different, different backgrounds, different interests. But they all share that kind of core that can live in sort of that crazy space that, that is entrepreneurship. Um, and so I agree that I can't, you can't give me 10 people, random people, and I can't make them all entrepreneurs because some of them just aren't cut out for it. Uh, but it's no different than any other kind of profession. I mean, not everybody's cut out to be a surgeon. Not everybody's cut out to be a pilot. Not everybody's cut out to be a teacher. Um, uh, it, it, we, we all kind of drift to things that kind of fit with who we are. So, so I kind of agree with that, which gets me in trouble in the entrepreneurship world sometimes. But then in the next breath, what I say is, but just like a brain surgeon, I want to make sure these people get trained before we turn them loose for the company. Just like I wouldn't want a brain surgeon going in my head without getting trained and, and educated or a pilot hopping in a plane and, and flying you know, across the country. These things, there are skills, 
Uh, there is knowledge, and 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 we've proven that that is important. Uh, when we look at success rates of entrepreneurs, you know, overall, the, the statistics vary, but but fifty percent ish of of all startups last about five years. When we look at those who uh, have had entrepreneurship education and training, uh, the the success rate. And, and the data is not real, uh, real robust on this, but it's consistent. So I, I believe it. Uh, it's somewhere around 75 to 85 percent last five years if they have training and education. That's a huge, uh, it's a huge delta in terms of success. You're improving their their success probability by at least 50 percent, if not more. Um, and as I tell my students, you know, if I can get you up to about 80 percent. Uh, I guarantee you that's probably higher than a lot of people have in their success in their first jobs. And so uh, it, it starts to make it more palatable for them. So I, I'm, I kind of come in the middle on that one, Elizabeth. It's, it's sort of one of these things where, uh, you know, I, er, early in my life, I had the knee jerk reaction. Of course, we can teach it. And but, but as I reflected more and more about that, you know, and you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs, thousands that I've worked with over the years, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always struck how many of them think they want to be an entrepreneur, but they get into the program and they go, oh, crap. Uh, no, this is not for me. I, I, I'm not cut out for this. I can't tolerate the risk. I can't tolerate the uncertainty. I, um, I, I don't want to put in the time, the hours. I don't have the work ethic. Um, so just like, you know, there's a whole lot more kids that go pre-med than there are who go to med school, I think we, just, we see some of the same thing in entrepreneurship. And in fact, uh, Dr. Schenkel, who was the first faculty member I hired when I started growing the program, he shared my belief that one of the best things we can do is, is show entrepreneurship realistically and, and so, that, so that people can make a choice not to do it. Uh, and if they do, they understand what they're getting into and, and embrace it. And, and so when we won the National Model Program Award from New South we, through Belmont, uh, I'm convinced that a, a big piece of that was the, the research that Mark and I did to, to, to measure um, the attitudes of our students. And we'd measure when they came into the program, we measured them when they left the program. And they were much more realistic the, they were much less idealistic and, 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 and more confident. So it was kind of, you know, we brought them down to earth, but also made them understand they were equipped for the journey. I think a big piece of that too is the work that you did with the Center for Entrepreneurship. And it takes it from the classroom and then allows students to put it into practice and to try and to fail and to pivot um, but to really kind of experience what that looks like rather than simply learning for four years and then going out into the real world and realizing I'm really not cut out for this or I really want to pursue a different venture idea. Um, so I think having a center for entrepreneurship, it's a very unique thing that Belmont has for our students. It's a very unique experience. And then more specifically, the program that you developed with the center is very unique compared to other entrepreneurship centers at other universities. So for people who really don't know what I'm talking about, give us a little bit of background of how you developed our Center for Entrepreneurship, what that means, and what kind of um, initial programs you developed that would correspond with what students are learning in the classroom. In, in my head, what the Center for Entrepreneurship is, um, is it offers the experiential learning that all business students need at some point. Most business students can get that through internships. And, and with entrepreneurs, um, that really doesn't make sense. You, it doesn't hurt for them to, to do an internship with an entrepreneur. I think they learn from that. But there's a certain set of skills that they can develop by doing this themselves. And, and, and many of them are driven to do that. And so, so my, my initial uh, 
theory with the center was I wanted to do two things. I wanted to give that experiential uh, playpen uh, to work in. And, and I also wanted it to be a magnet to draw kids from across campus because it was still kind of a new thing 20 years ago. And, and people were still going, what, wait, we have entrepreneurship? What do you mean? What does that do? And, and so I wanted to create some resources that would pull kids who were starting businesses in their dorms and their apartments into the program, even if they weren't our majors, so that we could help them, coach them, mentor them, and provide them with, with learning. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I am the very first to say that I think some of the best learning goes on through the center. If you have a really engaged student, they're going to learn a lot more through what the things that they can do in the center than they can do learn in the classroom. I've always viewed, I always viewed the classroom as supplemental, uh, to, to the kind of learning that they learn by, by actually going in, starting a business, being involved in things that way. And so I, I've tried to create programs that made that, uh, that broke down barriers for them in starting a business. And so the, the very first thing I had started that, that had great success at St. Thomas was this little place, uh, which we call the hatchery, where they could go and start a business. Uh, if I wanted this to be more college student-like, and, and so... Um, we had really good success with that at St. Thomas. So when I came to Belmont, the first thing I wanted was, uh, was to have a hatchery. And I wanted to have two. I wanted to have one at the business school, and I wanted to have one uh, somewhere else on campus so that we could have it accessible to the non-business students. Because a lot of the non-business students get a little bit creeped out when they go into business school, uh, especially when they're younger. So uh, I wanted to make it accessible. Then I'm trying to break down barriers here. And, and so getting it in the business school was fairly easy. And we had a space there. Um, convincing the university and, and then getting a decent space was a little bit more challenging away from the business building. Although we had a provost at the time. Uh, his name was Dan Alexander, who totally understood what I was trying to do and was incredibly supportive. Uh, in fact, when... when uh, when we were up for the national model program for the undergraduate program at Belmont, uh, he surprised us. At right that point, there's just three faculty. It was just me and, and Dr. Schenkel and Dr. Gonzalez. And he surprised us and, and flew to San Antonio where the conference was going on, he and the associate provost, to be there that evening when we found out if we had won or not. And, and I looked at him and I said, I said, dude, I don't even know if we're going to win. He said, I don't care. You're here. This is amazing for us. That's and awesome. We're going to celebrate. So, so he got it. And, 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 and when I was, I, you know, I kept saying, just give me a closet in the science building or give me a, you know, just, I, I just needed a spot. It doesn't have to be fancy. So when they were finishing the curb center, which is one of the first big building projects that Dr. Fisher uh, undertook when he came uh, 25 years ago, um, there was some spaces for students that they had in, in, in sort of what they call the, the um, I forget what that part of the building's called, but they've got the racquetball the Beeman, courts. The Student yeah. Life Center. Yeah, the Beeman Student Life Center. And they got mm -hmm. the racquetball courts and the climbing walls. And, and he wanted to have other student resources there. He wanted to be a, a place for all students on campus. So uh, he called me one day, said, meet me over at the Beeman Center. I want to show you something. And we, we, we met, went over there and, and, and he, we were, we're up on a stairway about in the middle of the space on the first landing. And he looked down and he said, see that space down there? It's empty. He said, that's going to be our, our hatchery. He said, I want you to do big and bold and, and, and dream big. And so we got a, a grant from the Coleman foundation and, and it helped us kind of get it set up and going. And, and, and so to me, that has always been sort of the, the, the heart of what we do is, is we provide these students who are trying to start businesses with that kind of program. What I've really come to appreciate the last 10 years is, is how much, since I've stepped down as director, how much uh, the, the center has gotten really focused on the things that work best. And, and I think that's why we've stood out, even though we haven't always been funded as well as some other schools across the country, 
continue to stand out because uh, you know we focused on what we do well and, and do it really well. I, I mean, I love the classroom. Uh, I, I wanted to miss the classroom. I'm proud of our our program, uh, and 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 I I do high, I still highly highly will highly recommend it to people. But to be honest, it's just a supplement. And if they're not trying to do stuff themselves, and I, I tell every one of my advisors that. I don't care what it is. Just try to start something, um, anything, because you're never going to have a safer place to do it and yep. more support. Yeah, that is what I love about the center. You know, sometimes people ask me, like, why don't you just go the route, the PhD route, and just teach full time? And what I love about what I'm currently doing is just the flexibility with where the students are. So we can have the hatchery that's open all the time for those that are hatching ideas or our student run businesses where there's retail space on campus that students can come together and develop a business plan and launch an idea and run an actual business. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but they learn through that. It's incredible learning that they get to do before they even graduate. Or we've got our accelerator program for those students that you're talking about who've already launched, who have 10 employees, you know, we can get them the mentorship or the, or, you know, the, the focused accelerator program and then everything in between with the competitions and the speakers and the mentors. And, you know, it's like, it's very, we're not tied to a semester. It can be as broad or as focused as needed at any time in the year. Yeah. So I just love that you launched this, that you started this. I'm sorry. I'd always dream of a two track program mm -hmm. and I tried to pull this off at, at St. Thomas and didn't work. And I, and I, I brought it up here a few times and it just, there was no interest in this, but I, I, I wanted to have a track for those kids who want to learn about entrepreneurship. And then I wanted a track for those who were engaged in entrepreneurship. And, and allow students to choose completely different tracks with different learning styles. Um, and and I, I, the, 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 the latter, the one for the students who are actually starting things, it's almost kind of like an honors kind of a program where they kind of, you know, they kind of, it, it's, it, it's it, their own curiosity and their own inquiry is what drives their learning. And, and, uh, it just was not something, and I get it. It, it just it, it it doesn't necessarily fit with the kind of academic environment. But uh, that's that's kind of what the center is a surrogate for, and, and allows us to be able to do. Yeah. So, I think you and I could probably talk forever <laughs> about curriculum and the and our program. Um, as you're looking towards this next chapter in life. You are retired. You are moving on to the next phase. Let's just kind of look back a little bit about more of what you've learned and what you've experienced over the years of your career, because you have had a very fruitful career. You've been extremely entrepreneurial, have had your hand in many things, and there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I feel like there's a lot of wisdom and um, nuggets that you can pass down to some of our younger entrepreneurs. I would love to like, let's go back to when you were a child who inspired you when you were a kid? Was there anything that really, um, that you felt inspired you and kind of led you to where you are? Uh, yeah, it was all the small business owners that I knew in my hometown growing up. And I, I don't mean that as a trite answer. It was, it was really true. I love, I admired those guys. I wanted to be those guys. I almost dropped out of college to go back and, and start a stereo store in my hometown those are my heroes, the small business owners that, you know, that, that kind of made that happen. Um, and, you know, and, and what I learned from them is, is to find, find your place in the market. You know, don't, don't try to create something fabulous. And, and of course, everybody's going to want it. Instead, go out and just see what people need and, and, and give it to them. It's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier to have customers who already want what you're giving them than to have to go out and educate your customers on, on how wonderful your new idea is. Uh, they both work, but I've always appreciated kind of the easy path, easier path, which is, uh, you know, let's go out and, and find find something in the market that needs help and let's, let's help it. 
Uh, and, and I've watched people do that. I watched people do that. All these small business owners and the ones that succeeded did that. The ones that didn't often, you know, they came up with ideas in their heads and thought they'd be great and never tested them and never, never asked the question, do people really want this? And uh, so I, I, I never had one hero um, or, or role model. It was, it was a collective. It was a, because I grew up in a little town in the Midwest without a stoplight. So a lot of people there had small businesses and, and, and I just, I, I love that lifestyle and admired what they did. I love that because so many times people think of entrepreneurship as innovation and tech and it's real flashy and it's Silicon Valley. And here you are kind of the opposite where you're like, I grew up in a small town and that is why entrepreneurship stood out to me. You know, it's the traditional and the truest sense. More than once in my career, I've been called a blue collar entrepreneurship guy. Yeah. Uh, and, and but most entrepreneurs are. <laughs> well, yeah, I I totally agree. And now, often they mean that as as a derogatory comment, but I it, I wore that with pride. I love that. I mean, that's that's why I've always loved helping students learn how to bootstrap. And you know, you're yeah, I'll teach them how to raise money because eventually you may have to, and, and that's great. But so many of the businesses that that exist in this country. Uh, it, it exists with very little financial support to begin with, and yet they find a way to do it. So uh, I, the tech stuff is fun and cool. I like technology. It's fun, you know, watching what goes on in healthcare today. But that's such a tiny part of entrepreneurship. It is, it is a fraction of a percent of, of, of what goes on. Uh, and, and so the, the ones I admire are, I admire them all, but the ones I admire the most are the ones that really just kind of do it with their own grit and determination. You've worked with hundreds of students over the years, undergrad students, graduate students, all across Belmont, all sorts of different majors. Do you have any stories that you really love to share? <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, I don't know why this one popped into my head, but um, I, I've learned... I've learned that, that people develop at their own pace. And, and there, are, there have been students who I've worked with who we thought were the next greatest thing. We're going to be these superstars who burn out, you know, within a year or two after graduation. And I won't name names, but there's, there's been legions of these guys. And, uh, and, and, and then on the other end of the spectrum are the ones who you know, while they were in school, you know, were knuckleheads and, and just, you know, it was like, why are you in college? Why are you doing this major? And, and some of them have turned into some of the most amazing entrepreneurs I know. Uh, one in particular, I have his permission to, to tell the story about him is uh, a guy by the name of Peter Smith, who started uh, Golden Spiral Marketing. And, and I was... I was pretty hard on him when he had me for foundations. Uh, and, and I think rightly so, because he just, you know, he was one of the most unengaged students in the class. And, and, and I, even, I went up to him one day, I said, are you a major? And, and he said, yeah. And I just kind of, I don't know what I said. I rolled my eyes and, you know, just went, oh my God. Uh, but by the time he graduated, he was engaged and he's turned into an amazing entrepreneur who, who, who has given countless hours of support to our students and our alums. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I, one of the things I have I've come to appreciate is, is uh, you never want to just do a snap judgment on, on, on any of these entrepreneurs because they all kind of go at their own pace. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to make them heroes too early and I don't want to give up on them too quickly because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lesson. It took me a while to learn as well. But working with college students, it's very interesting. And I, sometimes I, I have to remind myself of who I was when I was 18 and how, you know, I did not have the maturity to care about school as much as I should have or could have. And, you know, just having that grace, meet them where they are. And like you're saying, 
they're on their own timeline and you really never know when they're going to bloom, yep. you know? Yeah. A lot has changed about college students over the years. And, and I taught, I taught the late baby boomers all the way through Gen Z and, and every generation had their quirks and their differences, but that's been the one constant. So I think you're right. I think that's just, you know, the nature of, of, young adults. And, and, uh, and I, uh, like you, I think it took me a while to kind of figure that out. But once I did, it, it's great because I became a lot more measured. I didn't, you know, I didn't elevate somebody on a pedestal too quickly. And, and, uh, and, and you and I, we won't share any names on, on this, uh, this conversation, but we both have shared some of those people. And then there's these people who just, you know, almost didn't exist in the program that have blossomed into amazing entrepreneurs and, and done a, a really cool things and, 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 and turned into great people. You know, to me, that's, that's the one thing that I hope sets our program apart and will always set us apart is, is we don't just create great entrepreneurs. We create, uh, we also help reinforce that they become good people as well. And, and I want to be proud of them. Uh, for not only their financial success, but even more importantly, how they conduct themselves. That's always been a, an important part of that for me. Yeah. What are some of the accomplishments that you're really proud of over your entire career? Oh, I don't know. Um, I, I didn't get fired. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like, I don't like to look back on, on things that way. Um, I really don't. Um, because it's never just me, and and so, uh, um, I, yeah. Next question. <laughs> what do you regret? <laughs> Flip side. Any life? Any learning lessons or any life lessons? Any regrets? Nope. No. No. No I love regrets. It. Uh, lots of learning points in life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of them have led me to where I am. And hopefully all of them I've used to make myself a little better person. So you mentioned a little bit ago that you've taught everything from, you know, the late baby boomers to current students. What have you seen? What's it, some of the trends that you've seen in that, in those few decades in the entrepreneurial landscape in in the world, you know, what are some of the things that have changed and what are the, some of the, the things that you think are coming? So one of the biggest changes is entrepreneurship went from being sort of these renegade outcast kind of group. I mean, you know, the, the early entrepreneurship students were, were truly borderline antisocial people, I'm, I swear, because, it, you know, they had to be to go against the grain that much and do a program like that when the whole world was telling them it was stupid. Um, and, and so... Uh, to see that to the to the point where entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship became one of the coolest, trendiest majors to take uh, has been a huge swing. And, and and I think both ends of that had a lot of challenges. I mean, I, I had some I had a lot of student management challenges with those early renegades that I worked with. Uh, I mean, they broke every rule and 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 enjoyed breaking rules. And then all of a sudden you get a classroom where 80% of them are just there because it's a cool major. And, and you know, that, that creates challenges. So that, that's probably one of the biggest things that's changed is how our culture and our society has um, grown to uh, really uh, appreciate and, and, and almost idolize entrepreneurs, which that was not the case in the seventies and eighties. Um, I, I think people's uh, motivations have changed over the generations. Uh, uh, Gen X, uh, <laughs> they were all about the bottom line. Uh, I mean, every 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 one I had were all trying to get rich and famous, and or at least rich. And and then you fast forward to the millennials, and then and 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 all of a sudden, you know, they view entrepreneurship as something that helps make the world a better place, uh, that allows them to lead a, a fuller life 
and a fuller lifestyle. Um, and, and so that's been a really interesting transition to watch that change. Um, and so, I, you know, where is it headed? I don't know. We're kind of at an inflection point culturally right now. And, and, and I, 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 I struggle to kind of understand that where that's going to take us. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a war being fought against free enterprise and, and capitalism. And uh, to the point where people are afraid to say the word capitalism. But it, it's, just, it's just a system. It's a system that works. It's a system that's created an incredible, the incredible world we have. I mean, look at us having this conversation over these machines, and and, and that you know all of that's because of, of entrepreneurs that you know that that creatively destroyed things that used to be and, and weren't afraid to do that, and 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 so I I, I worry that we may have a, a, a swing back and, and even an even more uh, dramatic swing back. Um, culturally and in our society uh, in terms of how we view entrepreneurs and how we view business ownership. Uh, I, I pray that we don't, but I, I worry about that. Uh, you know, when I, when I have students in an entrepreneurship class question the morality of free enterprise, I mean, what do you do with that in entrepreneurship? That free enterprise, that, that's what entrepreneurship is. You have the freedom to start something on your own. You don't, the government doesn't tell you to do it. Uh, you, you know, you're not dictated to do it by your, 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 your place in society because of your family. It's not a caste system. It's free. You can, anybody can do whatever they want to do. And, and it allows, uh, you know, people to, to start, to succeed, to fail. And, and, and I, I, I love that. And, and for people to question the morality of that is, 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 it was very discouraging for me the last few years. It's not everybody, but I'm shocked at how many people in an entrepreneurship program question that foundational kind of aspect of the program. Um, I, I bristle against people that are trying to define entrepreneurship simply as a way of thinking and, and kind of a creative mindset. I think a creative mindset is important, but entrepreneurship is action. Entrepreneurship is people willing to go out and, and take the risk personally, financially, in every way you can imagine, reputationally, and, and, and to act on, on the opportunities that they see uh, in the marketplace. Uh, that's an incredible thing. And, it, 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 and I, I, I don't like when we, it, it's been a battle that we've had in entrepreneurship the whole time I've been involved academically. So, you know, 30, 40 years, I've been watching people try and hijack the word entrepreneurship to become something else. But to me, it's very simple. It's, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's owning a company. That's it. You know, you're at risk. You own it. You're an entrepreneur. And, and, and it, 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 it's as simple as that. You may have started it. You may have inherited it from your family, but you're at risk. And, 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 and it's success and it's failures in your hands. That's, that's an entrepreneur. It's simple as that. And, and uh, I hope we never lose sight of that. Yeah. So what is it like now? Because this is something every entrepreneur goes through at some point in their entrepreneurial journey. You know, you touched on it a little bit with the healthcare companies that you started and you had to exit and move on to the next thing. And here you are again, you've invested decades of your life. And now you're exiting and you're yep. moving on to the next yep. chapter. But it hasn't just simply been a job for you. It's something that blood, sweat, and tears, it came out of you. <laughs> you know, you created this. Um, what is it like to walk away? You know, and how do you, how do you encourage entrepreneurs who are in a similar position when it's time to, whether you're exiting or whether you're moving on to the next chapter, what is it like to have invested so much in something and then to step back and to let it continue to grow without you having to be there. Well, for the entrepreneur, it's it's easy because easier because what that usually means is you get a nice big paycheck, a really big check, and and you know I always I always tell entrepreneurs, 
Um, at, at, at the end of it all, a business is just an asset. And, and, and if you can build that asset, asset up to enough value, sell it, you know, just like a house or a car or anything else. Um, it's just an asset. And, and, and I think sometimes people get way too emotionally attached to things, you know, that's that. And I think that that's, that's true in our society. And, and I think it's particularly true of a lot of entrepreneurs. So, so, um, when we exited the, the the healthcare business, it was it was the time it was the right time. Uh, we were actually about a year too late, uh, but we still did we still did well. But it was just time that the industry was changing. It was time, uh, and, and so everything has uh, you know has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Everything does. And so, uh, quite honestly, when I came to Belmont, I, I planned to be. Uh, here for about five to six years and I wanted to get the program up and going and then we'd go somewhere else and I'd do it again when rinse repeat because that's what entrepreneurs do the funny thing happened along the way though we, you know I uh, first of all both of our kids moved to Nashville and, and have developed deep roots here and, and second of all um, we fell in love with the city we fell in love with the people we fell in love with the Belmont community and the culture of Belmont. And, and so um, ended up staying. Uh, but even something that has those kind of roots has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, when I came here, <laughs> Dr. Fisher, um, I had a long interview with him, which faculty usually don't get interviewed for a long time by the president, but I did. And and one of the questions he kept pushing me on is, you know, what is success going to look like? How will I know if you've done a good job with this? And I think he was wanting me to say something about the number of students, the number of business started, and, and all that's, you know, those are all fair measurements. I said, but as the founder of this program, the true measure of success is that this thing is going to continue and get better when I leave someday. And, and and that that's not a given. Uh, I I can I can name dozens and dozens and dozens of entrepreneurship programs across the country that 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 faded into kind of mediocrity after the founder left. And my goal for the Belmont program was always to build it to a point where I knew I could step away and it would just continue to thrive and 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 do well. And and about two or three years ago, after all the great work you've done with the center, and after I've watched the, the faculty I brought in, you know, mature and kind of get comfortable with what they're doing, and we've had no faculty turnover so far, which is crazy. It's incredible. About two or three years ago, I, I started to think, you know what? This place will do just fine when I'm gone. And, and so that was when I kind of got into the mindset it, it was probably time and, and and quite frankly I was I was ready to go a couple of years ago but we've had some changes at the university and and then we had covid and, and so there was just a lot of stuff going on that I didn't feel comfortable leaving uh, quite yet but uh, but I knew it was it was you know in the next couple of years so uh, that I, I have great peace with that. I know the program's in amazing, amazing hands, and I, and I and I think to some degree, getting my shadow away from from people is is going to allow everybody just to take even more ownership of it and take it to places I could never have dreamed of. You know, one thing that we surprised you with in December, as we were preparing for you to retire and to move on. And this uh, is the understatement of this conversation. All right, go ahead. <laughs> There is such a legacy that you will be leaving, and we wanted to honor that and honor the work that you've done and, and everything that has been created through the work that you've done. So we surprised you with a fund that we, we built in your name, in your honor. It's the Jeffrey Cornwall Legacy Launch Fund, where alumni, donors, students, parents, anyone can give to this fund, and 100% 
of the money goes directly to graduating seniors to get their business off the ground. It's that initial seed capital um, startup costs, you know, just those initial costs that an entrepreneur fresh out of college could use to help them actually go and, and succeed in their business. And we knew that was going to be so important for you because that's what excites you. And that's the legacy and that you want these students to go and, and fulfill their dreams. So that is something that it's, it's endowed. And we, in three weeks, we were able to raise an incredible amount of money. We're continuing to raise money for that, but that will continue to live on, um, in your honor, you know, and you say like you needed to walk away or step away so that your shadow won't be a hindrance. And I really don't see it that way at all. I I'm going to disagree with you on that. I think it's more, you have left these seeds, you know, you've planted seeds everywhere. And even when you're not here, like it can grow and it will continue to grow and, and your legacy will still be, um, in the midst of everything here at Belmont entrepreneurship. So thank you for everything that you've done over the years. I really, we can't even get it in, in an hour long conversation, but the fruits of your labor have just been tremendous. And there's hundreds of people I know who've been impacted by you over the years. So thank you, Jeff. Well, you're, you're about to make an old grandpa cry. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on. <laughs> thank you. I, that means a lot to me. And, and, and that fun, uh, I, I was shocked, overwhelmed, but I couldn't think of something better. You know, when, when it, when word got out that I was going to be retiring, the students kept saying, Oh, they're going to name a building after you. And I said, well, First of all, I'm not going to write a big enough check to the university to make it happen. <laughs> it's not how that works. You have to pay for that. Yeah. yeah. And I said, second of all, I, I, you know, I, I don't know for me that has a lot of meaning, just a, a building. Just, you know, a lot, a lot can happen in a building. And, and so when you guys did this, it, it was like, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. So thank you. Well, I end all of these interviews with a question about advice. What is your advice for a young entrepreneur, for someone who's just starting out? What is your, your advice that you would leave them with? Um, you know, I think, I think particularly today, um, I, I see, I see young entrepreneurs entering a world with an incredible amount of uncertainty. Uh, the pandemic, the economy, uh, our culture, everything. And, and what I think they should keep in mind is that in some ways, the more chaos there is, the more opportunity there is for entrepreneurs. And, and I think there's going to be, uh, I, I think there's huge opportunities um, for amazing businesses to be created over the next decade or two because of all of the turbulence we've been going through right now. And so, um, you know, don't be, don't be discouraged by that. Don't be uh, intimidated by that. In fact, embrace that. That's, that's what creates this. You know, if you, if you look back, when I, when I came out and was having such a hard time getting a job in my MBA, that was a time of huge transition in this country, you know, economically, culturally, and in so many ways. This, you know, the the, the '70s uh, was was sort of the hangover decade after the '60s, and, and it was just it was a mess. And yet, we look back at, at at all the amazing businesses that were started at that time, and 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 how it transformed our our world because the industrial based society was dying and that's why i was having a hard time finding a job it was you know we had we had as i said everything is a bit beginning middle and an end and we had this manufacturing era of the 1990 or 1900s rather that that was what's waiting it was on its way out and it was the entrepreneurs that found what's next and we're going to have a what's next i have no idea what it is that's, that's the fun of this. That's the excitement of this. And, and so rather than being discouraged by having a time of so much turmoil and disruption and so forth, I think, I think if you really approach this with the right attitude, 
you're going to be able to see so many opportunities out there in the next decade or two. And, and for us to continue to have economic success uh, as, a, as, a, as a country, uh, we, need, we need that. Uh, we need that rebirth. And it's, it's, we're at that point where, and, and, and we always go through these cycles. Uh, it, it's fascinating that I began my career and I end my career at very similar times like that. Uh, and it's about a 50 year cycle, 50 to 70 years. And this one's been 50 and it's, it's time. So uh, don't be discouraged at all. To the contrary, uh, this, is, this is what looses the soil that allows us to do all these cool things. Our shout out of the week goes to Matt and Maggie Kuiper, founders of Harpeth Painting. Matt graduated in 2006 with a business degree, and Maggie finished her psychology degree that following year. Harpeth Painting connects character with craftsmanship, providing residential and commercial painting services with amazing quality. And as a bonus, Maggie is Dr. Cornwall's daughter. To learn more, visit harpethpainting.com. Can I ask you some rapid fire questions before we go? Surely. Okay. If there were to be a theme song for your life, what would it be? <laughs> oh, oh. I know if I give you enough time, you'll have a really great answer to this question. Still crazy after all these years. <laughs> yes. Okay. What did you want to be when you grew up, when you were a kid? Wow. Um, I think back then, most of us wanted to be either astronauts or oceanographers. Because um, uh, Jacques Cousteau was kind of all of a sudden coming in and, into things. And, and, and I had grown up watching all those people blast into space and I watched them walk on the moon and all that stuff. And, and so I, I had dreams both uh, up and, and, and down, uh, so to speak. Yeah. That's fascinating. I know you and Anne are big music lovers. What was the last concert that you guys went to? So it, we had not been to the, to the Ryman since COVID. And, and we used to go to the Ryman easily once a month. And yeah. we go to the city winery two or three times a month. And it, we did music every weekend. And, and so it was really neat to go back. And we went back and we saw uh, an artist who we've always loved, but never been able to score tickets to. And it was Van Morrison. And, and it, was, it was such a wonderful concert. He did such a good job. And it, it was really great to be back. Now, that wasn't the first concert we went to since COVID, but we haven't been to a lot. But that was, that was the most recent one. Wow. I'm so bummed I missed that. It was so good. Oh. It was so good. He's still... He's still as quirky as he always was. And, yeah. And, and it was just an amazing band. We had so much fun. That's so that. fun. Our first dance at our wedding was Crazy Love. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. You guys travel all the time. What's the best vacation that you've been on? I would probably have to say our 40th anniversary. Um uh, I'm a big fan of Ireland, um, love Ireland, and, and, and so I was thrilled when I learned recently I have a little, tiny little bit of Irish blood in me, which explains why I like going there so much. <laughs> and and I finally uh, was able to take Anne along. She had never been able to go, and, um, and and she was excited about it. So we we planned this wonderful trip to Ireland, and and she uh, not. <laughs> Not too long before we left, she goes, how would you like to stay a little bit longer? I said, sure. And she found a cruise that left Dublin and, and went up the, the coast of Norway. And, nice. And so uh, and it, the whole trip ended up being about three weeks. It was, it was Ireland and then it was Norway. And it was just, it was a magical, and it was our 40th anniversary, which is kind of cool. So that was pretty magical. So nice. So nice. Well, last question. What are you looking forward to most? in this next stage of life? A new adventure or two. Um, I, I am enjoying being able to spend more time with my hobbies. Uh, I love photography and I'm learning some, uh, I've been learning uh, Lightroom, which is a Photoshop product and, and really working on that and working on my golf game. Uh, but I, I, I have a, 
I have a project or two left in me, and I'm, I'm working on one right now that is kind of intriguing to me. Um, and, and I'm not willing to share much about it other than it involves uh, a tenth book uh, for my resume. But this is a very different project, and it's it's actually something that I've talked about doing since 1980. So it's been in the back of my head for all those years. And now I have the time. It's a book that's going to take some time, and, and it's going to be more than just a book. There's a lot to it, but uh, I'm, I'm ready for a new adventure like that. So I can't wait to learn more. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Jeff. I'm honored. And, and I just want to say again how proud I am of what you've done and and and, and so excited for Belmont's program's future. And all. So thanks for, thanks for letting me be part of this. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I mean, I'm forever indebted to you <laughs> for giving me a job and, you know, a dream job at that. But the everything that you've done, it just... It's just incredible. So thank you for your your work at Belmont. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your friendship. Um, Just so grateful to know you. Likewise. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. What If is produced by Old Soul. For links and show notes, please visit belmontetp.com slash what if. Until next time, keep asking what if.